We're doing okay? Good? Everybody doing okay? Everyone's good, right? Okay, good. Okay. It's a little bit. There's worse places to be. Come on. Um, now, thank you guys for being here, uh, for real. So it's, it's been two weeks since I've been up here, which is rare for me. I don't, I don't really do that. Uh, Josh did a fantastic job two weeks ago, and if you weren't here last week, uh, Greg really did a, a great job. Yeah. It's, uh, it's weird to see Greg get fiery, isn't it? He's such a nice guy. And when you see him get fiery, you're kind of like, whoa, Greg. Um, uh, he didn't say this on Sunday. I think he said it on Saturday, but he, he might not have told you guys. He did that on two hours notice, because uh, Saturday, um, about two hours before service started, I, I had found out that, that my wife's younger brother had passed away, and so I stepped away uh, to be with her and to be with her family. So um, Greg did a good job. He did a really good job. Obviously, the Holy Spirit working through him, if you have to do it on that short of notice, and you still do a, a wonderful job with it. So we've been working through the book of Romans. If you've never been here before, this is what we do. We go through whole books of the Bible, and Romans may be, may be one of the most important books in the Bible. We get so much of our, our Christian theology, so much of our Christian doctrine from the book of Romans, and we happen to be in chapter 8, which... It's kind of a, a, a lot to set yourself up for when you say this, but many theologians, uh, teachers of the Bible, would say that Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in the entire Word of God, which is a, a big statement. I don't know if I think it's the most important, but it's, it's very high up there. Very important, very powerful. There's a lot said about basically our transformation that comes in Christ. And that was kind of Greg's point last week, is that when we become believers— we are set free from condemnation, which means guilt, right? We're guilty until we, we become followers of Jesus. And through Jesus, this is important, we're not just delivered from guilt, we're delivered to live in a life that honors God. So we're saved from something, but we're also saved to something, okay? Which means that we live a life that honors the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, God, okay? So in the second half of chapter 8, so we split chapter 8 into two parts. In chapter 8, in the second part, which is, you're gonna, you're, we're going to read some stuff today that, that you've heard somewhere, right? Even if you're not a Christian, there's some very profound statements that have kind of penetrated culture and, and, and words that people pull out that are very, very important. And we're going to talk about those things. And, and at the end of chapter 8, in my humble opinion the three most important words in the life of a Christian are found at the end of Romans chapter eight. I'm not gonna tell it to you yet because you can just get up and leave then, right? You've heard it. So uh, no, well, I'm gonna make you hold on and we'll talk about the three most important words, uh, in my opinion, in the entire Bible. So you should've got a notes handout when you came in. Everything I'm gonna say will be in there. Uh, everything will be on the screens. If you have a, a smartphone, the Experience Community app, if you have an old school copy of the scripture, uh, this is a, it's called a book. If you have one of those, um, we are in the sixth book of the New Testament, the book of Romans, starting in verse 18 in chapter 8. Now, let me, I'm, I'm just going to give a brief preface uh, this morning. Maybe it's I'm a little raw. Uh, maybe I'm just a little exhausted by uh, the state of humanity right now. But uh, I'm going to preach a little bit this morning, and I'm not trying to be uh, a jerk. Uh, I, I love you. I feel like I genuinely love people, and um, I feel like I'm empathetic to people, but sometimes that comes off <sighs> mean or sarcastic, and my goal this morning is not to be mean or sarcastic, but, but um, I teach a lot, and I think every once in a while, God calls me to, to preach, and, and today is one of those days, and so I hope you receive it well. I hope I deliver it well. Um, I'll show a little bit of grace for you if you'll please show a little bit of grace for me, and um, we'll see where God takes us, okay? So let's pray. Let's jump into this letter that Paul wrote to a church in Rome in about the fifth century or so, or I'm not sorry, in the first century in about the 50th year uh, that Paul wrote to this church in Rome, and um, we'll see where God takes us this morning, okay? Father, Lord, we love you. Oh, God. We are privileged, Lord, to be in this room, not because this is the experienced community, God, but because we have the freedom to openly discuss your word. We have the freedom to worship you, God. We have the freedom to 
come into this comfortable environment, God, and be, and be sharpened and instructed by your word given through Paul, God. I pray that you just keep your hand on our church today, God. Lord, open up our understanding, open up our minds. Lord, let us be honest and vulnerable, and Lord, let us be real and authentic this morning. God, uh, we pray for every church in our city. We pray for all of our different campuses and the cities that they're located in. And um, we just pray that everything we do today, God, that it honors you and uh, lifts you up and, and uh, that it speaks to our hearts, God, and changes us, Lord. We love you. We thank you. and pray all these things in your son's name, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm gonna read a little bit. We'll go back and break it down uh, to the best of our ability and see what God says, okay? Here we go. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what they see? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. If you haven't been here, so chapters six through eight, I'd say chapter six is actually my favorite. Chapters six through eight are my favorite parts of the book of Romans because that section of Romans is all about the fact that when we become followers of Jesus, we are given a new life. We are born again, we are a new creation, freed from sin's claims to live out the purpose that God has for us. Now, the second half of Romans chapter eight just drives that point home, that we have a newness of life, okay? Now, the way he's gonna drive it home, Paul, for us today is in three different, different ways or directions. The first one is, is God has given us promises when we have a newness of life. God also gives us purpose, right, in this life, and then he also protects us spiritually until he comes back or, or we pass away. So the promises of God, the purposes of God, the protection of God. And what Paul says is, is that this life is tough. There is suffering in this life. There is hardship in this life. There is, is, there is let down in this life. And so he reminds us that Jesus has gone on to prepare a place after this life. And we have a promise of this afterlife if we follow him. The Bible also calls Christians, I hope that's most of you in this room, we are called foreigners in this world. This is not our home. We are migrants. The Bible says we are aliens. We should not be too comfortable here because this is not home. So again, the Bible says we will suffer in this temporary residency, and we will especially suffer for the name of Christ. But Paul says the suffering of this life is nothing. It's not even worth comparing to how beautiful the life after this will be for the follower of Jesus. He says it's not even worth comparing. We're gonna talk about that a lot today, that way too many people are in love with this world, and I don't get it, because this world is so messed up and so broken, and just like Paul said in chapter one of Romans, we live in a culture that has exchanged the truth of God in for a lie. And so we have been under this curse ever since Genesis chapter three, when humanity sinned, all of us who've been alive have lived under the futility of sin. What that means is this. When we choose to live the ways that we want to live versus the way God wants us to live, it's futile. It doesn't end up anywhere good. That's what the Bible says. Now listen, I watched this documentary lately. I like documentaries. And I always have to give a preface when I watch things or, or, or listen to things and I tell people about it because some people will, will listen to it and there's something they don't like or watch it and there's something... I thought Corey was a good guy, but he's really the devil. And, and listen, so I'm going to give a preface. This documentary is, is on Amazon. It's called Generation Wealth. Now, before you download it or, or look it up, it is exceptionally graphic. Exceptionally graphic. Very graphic. 
It's not a Christian documentary. And the reason why I found it so compelling is there is a secular, non-believing, she's Jewish and she lives in California. She's a photographer and she has been following the same group of people for about 30 years. She's been, she's been the photographer of the most wealthy, powerful, influential, famous, influential person, people all throughout American culture for 30 years. And the whole documentary, though, is as she had followed these people who were either porn stars or people who were on Wall Street or people who were children of famous actors and things like that. She says it's interesting, this pursuit of this, this hyper-American dream always ends up in catastrophe. A secular photographer said the ways of this American dream only end up in destruction. It's exactly what the Bible has been telling us for thousands of years, that the ways of the world are futile. But one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to lift this futility from us and we're going to live in perfection with him forever. Now, again, I'm not trying to be a downer to you today, but those of us that have the Holy Spirit in us, we feel something different in this culture right now. It has been the first time in my 41 years where I have looked up to the sky and said, Lord, come quickly, I'm ready. And that's why Paul said there's a groaning. There's a groaning of the earth, right? Labor pains, he says. And then there is a groaning within those that have the spirit because we're really feeling like we're not at home. This isn't my home. And Paul says we are eagerly waiting the redemption of our bodies, right? We're looking up to the sky saying, Lord, just like John did in Revelation, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. And listen, this longing is a good thing. This is okay. And if you claim, and I'm not trying to be a jerk today, guys. I'm just, man, I'm, I'm going to pretend to be your pastor for an hour or so here. If one claims to have a relationship with Jesus, but does not recognize the futility of the culture you live in. If one claims to have a relationship with Jesus, but does not long to be in our permanent home with him. I would say you might not have a relationship with Jesus. It is very superficial at best. And to the Christian, to the one that has the Holy Spirit in them, the state of humanity right now should bother you. It should be unsettling to you. And what it should do is it shouldn't drive us to isolation. It shouldn't drive us to hatred. It should drive us to our knees because we should love even the lost. And we should want them to be saved. But there is no sense of urgency in the, in, in the church in the United States right now. No sense of urgency. And there should be. Because the world out there is on fire. And we know the only thing that can change things. Right? We know the only way that, that salvation comes. And it is that Holy Spirit that we should possess. It is, it is the Holy Spirit that is in Christians that gives us a taste of the perfection that is to come. Not just the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, like love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, these things, self-control, that's a big one, right? It's not just the fruit that should come out of the Spirit living inside of us and should manifest itself. It is also the giftings of the Spirit, wisdom and discernment and knowledge and, and healing and miracles, that these, these things give us a glimpse, they give us a taste of what an eternity with Christ is going to be like. And yes, we're going to groan in this life. What that means is, is we're going to face bad things. We're going to get tired, right? But, but the reason why, huh, the reason why my wife is, is, is doing as well as she is right now, don't, don't get me wrong, man. She struggles. Her, her brother, her younger brother was her best friend. She struggles with the loss she just suffered with. But because of the Holy Spirit, Paul says we can be pressed down, but we're not destroyed. We're not crushed. Because the Holy Spirit in us can never be crushed. And it is a relationship with Christ that gives us peace in the middle of chaos. Contentment in the middle of despair. But you have to have the Holy Spirit of Christ in you. You have to have the Holy Spirit of Christ in you. And Paul says we hope for the things that we don't see. What Paul is saying is hold on. Because in times like we live in right now, I found myself outside the other day. We have a, a garage and then we have like a carport on the side and, and, and I park one of my cars under there. And I was just sitting out there and I was like, God, like I, I, don't, I don't see it right now. I don't see the light right now. 
But what Paul is saying is, if we have the Holy Spirit, we can patiently, we can eagerly wait when all this mess is going to be over. over. So my question for you today, though, is this. Are you looking to the sky? Are you anticipating Jesus coming back and sitting on the throne? Are you anticipating the life to come? Or, listen to me, have some of you become so entrenched and quite frankly in love with the things of this world? And that is problematic. It's not wrong that we enjoy things in this world. It's not problematic that you you get a promotion or that you have enough money in the bank to put your kids through college. There's nothing wrong with that. But when those become our first love, there is a theological problem with that. Because John said, do not love the world. That doesn't mean the earth. Doesn't mean it's wrong to recycle. We recycle here at the church. We're called to take care of the earth, and we do. It doesn't mean don't love the people of the world. We are to love the people of the world. When the Bible says do not love the world, it means the systems of the world. It means that your political affiliation is not your hope and identity. It means that the economy of the United States is not where your prosperity comes from. It means that the the culture of our world, the pursuit of materialism and greed and popularity and fame Those systems are bankrupt. And if we fall in love with those systems, there is no room, I'm just quoting scripture, for God's love to be in our heart. And it saddens me to see people in this church who I believe are genuinely in love with the pursuits of the world. Because what that shows me is that the love of the Father is really not in you. And that is sad to see. Do you know why it's important that we understand this? Jesus said there is, there, that you can't have one hand on him and one hand on the pursuit of this world because Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You're either going to love one and hate the other or, or hate the one and love the other. You can't do it. Jesus says you can't serve both God and fill in the blank, right? You can only serve him. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in times of weakness because we do, not, we do not know what to pray when we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groaning. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those that love God, who are called according to his purpose, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So we don't just have a promise of a perfect future. We also have purpose today. You have purpose today. And so the hope we have in Christ and the purpose we have in Christ sustains us through hard times. It gives us the ability to hold on. And not just for ourselves, it gives us the ability to help others along when they're struggling. That's why Galatians says, bear each other's burdens. That fulfills the law of Christ. We're to be there for each other as well. Now listen, The only way that we can be sustained in this time is we must have a prayer life, which means we have to talk to Jesus. Now, again, I love you, and I love you so much that I always want to speak truth to you. We're going to have a worship night in a couple of months on the square. We'll have seven, 8,000 people at that worship night, and that's great. We need to worship, but you cannot grow in a relationship with God With worship alone, you must also have a prayer life. And so we're going to have a prayer night here Friday. And I bet we don't have 700 people at that. We'll have 7,500 out there worshiping. But when it comes to being honest and vulnerable and transparent and talking, do you know what that's like? It's like saying to your spouse, I only want to have sex with you, but I don't ever want to talk to you. I'm just going to talk to you like adults here today. You got to pray. And unless you pray, you're never going to grow in your relationship with God. And and here's the thing. When we pray, 
And when we read the word of God, it says the spirit steps in, it intercedes for us, it intervenes. I get really frustrated with a lot of Christians, right? Christians, I'm gonna use air quotes a lot today. A lot of Christians. Because I'll have a serious meeting with some people who are going through some stuff or there's some tension between people and I have to mediate and we'll get together in a room and they'll say, hey, before we do this meeting, can we pray? And I'm like, well, wait a second. We've known about it for three weeks. What, have you not been praying yet? What that means is this. We're not gonna have time in this world. When life smacks us in the face, you can't say, oh, hey, everyone pause for a second. God, forgive me for all the porn I looked at. God, forgive me for, for not paying, paying my tithes. God, forgive me for my doubt and for, forgive me for this and this and this and God, be with me right now. Okay, let's, okay. You don't have time to do that. But here's the thing. If you have a prayer life, when life does smack you, you don't have to push pause on anything because you have a relationship with Jesus. He gives you the gift of knowledge. He gives you the gift of wisdom. He gives you the discernment in those moments so you don't have to say, okay, everyone stop for a second, right? It's like someone who's a police officer, but they've never been trained how to use a gun. Robbers right there with a the gun pointed at them and they're like, hold on a second. I think the safety's off. I think that's how, okay, go ahead. But that's what we do with God, isn't it? Hey God, I know all this unrepented sin is in my life before we move forward and, and I ask you for something. Hold on real quick. That's not the way it works. We have to pray. We have to have the word of God in us. And when we live connected with him, he fills in the gaps. He gives us the gifts that we need. And that brings us to maybe what is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in the entire Bible. When people say, we know that all things work together for the good of those that love him. That does not mean that everything that happens is God's will. I hear so many Christians say, well, I guess it was God's will that my husband had that affair with the secretary and ran off. And I'm like, sin is never God's will. In fact, the Bible says it is God's will that no one goes to hell. That doesn't mean people aren't going to go to hell. People are going to go to hell. But that's not God's desire for us. That's not his will for our life. What this scripture means is if we have a relationship with Jesus, when things happen that are not God's will and they affect us, when those things happen, we know that eventually, because we have a relationship with him, everything that happens is going to end up glorifying God. And when God is glorified, we benefit from that. So not all the things that happened to you were God's plan, but because we have a relationship with him, God always takes the lemons and he makes it into lemonade, right? Because he loves us and he does that. And so here's the thing. When we read this book, it has to be less about us and more about him. Verse 28 doesn't mean that we always get our will, but that we should constantly be evolving to seek out his will. And at the end of all of this, God's ultimate plan cannot be thwarted. It cannot be thrown off. God's going to get what God wants. And again, this doesn't mean that we cannot live outside of the will of God. We can live outside of the will of God. But the true Christian says, God, what is your will? God, I pray that your will be done. God, you see what I want, but I want what you want more. Because we know that his desire is better than our desire. That his ways are better than our ways. And then this is when all the, the, the fist fights break out, right? For those he foreknew, he predestined them. It is God's desire that for all willing people, that he makes us into the image of Jesus. That doesn't mean we're equal with Jesus, with Jesus, but God wants to make us perfect eventually the way Jesus is perfect. And his method of doing that is because Jesus has died on the cross for us, because we are adopted into the family of God, because we will eventually be with God in heaven, we will be made perfect. Now, with these two words, foreknew and predestined, this has been the source of arguing for about six centuries now. And we can easily fall into the trap of trying to understand and, and explain an incomprehensible God. And you don't have to understand all the details of foreknowledge and predestined. Here's what you need to know about God. God is sovereign, which means nothing happens outside of God's scope. Nothing. The other thing you need to know about God is God is good. If God did it, it's good. Well, Corey, I don't understand. It doesn't matter if you understand. If God did it, it's good. 
He is sovereign and he is good. And that's what we need to know about him. And so Paul lines out, this is what happens when we're saved. This is the order of salvation, the ordo salutis. That God has a foreknowledge of who will choose him. He predestines them. He calls them. He, he regenerates them. He starts to make them new. We have faith. We repent for our sin. We are justified, which, made, which means we are declared innocent in front of God. Because we're innocent, we're adopted into the family of God. We are sanctified, which means we are made to be more and more like Jesus as life goes on. We persevere because the Holy Spirit is with us, right? Pressed down, but not crushed. And then eventually Jesus comes back and we are glorified and we are made perfect in the image of Jesus Christ. This is the order of salvation. Now, here's what we need to be careful about. We need to be careful not to miss the point. This idea of people arguing about foreknowledge and predestination, Calvinism, Arminianism. And if you don't know who those two guys are, that's fine. Just know who Jesus is, right? That's what's important. We miss the whole point that God has a purpose. That passage is not about you. It's about him. The key element is God. He calls, he forgives, he justifies, he, he gets all the glory. It's him. It's not us. This book is about him. It's not about us. And this book was given to us so we can get on board with what he is doing and his desire and his plan for us. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that come, they just want to argue, right? Listen, let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you how my brain works. If people continually ask me if they can lose their salvation, Corey, do you think people can lose your salvation? You know, what my first thought is, what sin do you need to repent of? Corey, do you think you can lose your salvation? What are you doing? What, what, what are you doing that no one knows about? What are, you, what are you doing? You know what? Whenever people come up to me and they say, well, I said a prayer one time when I was 13, and, and I'm good. I've been living like hell ever since. And I'd say, wait a second. Do you believe that righteousness and holiness is not a staple of the Christian life? So if you're constantly asking your wife if you can get divorced, I would say your marriage probably isn't that good. If you're constantly living like you're not even married, I would say your marriage is not that good. In the same way, if you're constantly asking if you can be distant from God and still be saved, I'd say you probably don't have a relationship with Jesus. If you're constantly saying that I don't have to live out the principles of this book, I would say you probably don't know Jesus. The point is this. Let me, I guess, clear up some theology. If you are honoring Jesus with your mind, body, and soul, you don't have to worry about ever getting divorced from God. You don't have to worry about losing your salvation. And the fruit of the Spirit will naturally bloom up from your life if you're honoring God with your mind, body, and soul. You don't need to rest in your understanding. You just need to rest in his understanding, okay? All right. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, Paul says, and all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul says all this to us, and he says, so what do we say about this? Not only does God give us a promise of a future, not only does he give us purpose in this life, but he's going to protect us spiritually until this life is over. This very simple phrase, man, this should encourage you. 
if God is for me, who can be against me? Who can stand against me? If we have a relationship with him, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that can tear you away from the relationship you have with Jesus. Nothing can tear you away from that. How do we know that? If you're in here today and you're not a believer, how do you know that any of this has validity? We know it in Jesus. We know because God gave us his best. He gave his only son, offered him up for all of us. And if God was willing to give his only son and die for us while we were sinners, why would we think that Jesus would leave us hanging? Why do we think that God's not going to give us everything we need to hold on until he comes back? Here is our problem. You and I live in a culture that says we don't need a savior because we're already good. That we just need to look inside ourselves, right? Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah addresses that. This culture right now is look inside your heart. Jeremiah says your heart is corrupt. Your heart will cause you to cheat on your husband. Your heart will cause you to spend more money than you have. Your heart will cause you to hurt somebody or to hurt yourself. Your heart is a liar to you. Your emotions will deceive you. Don't follow your heart. Follow the Holy Spirit that I hope resides in your heart. That's what we need to do. But we live in a culture that is so selfish, right? Listen, I'm... Bear with me for a second, and I love you guys, and that's why I'm going to say this. When we take communion every single week, it is symbolic. It is a remembrance of the fact that God gave his only son to die for us. Now, listen, please. When I see 60, 70 percent of you bolt out those doors when we take communion, I'm going to tell you how angry that makes me. And let me tell you why. Who do you think you are that you think your plans outside of this place are more important than honoring the Christ that you claim to follow that died for you on the cross? Hold, hold, no, 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 don't, 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 don't. Because so many of you are guilty right now. Listen, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But it is the height of arrogance to think that we have something to do that is more important than taking five or ten minutes to honor the Savior that hung on a piece of wood for nine hours for your soul. And I sit back here as the pastor of a church that I love and I am proud of, and I am disgusted to see you bolt for the door when we are taking the Lord's Supper. I love you. I love you. I love you. There is nothing outside that is more important than you remembering what Christ has done for you on the cross. Nothing out there. And so it is so arrogant. Well, I've got things to do. I don't care. I don't care. And now I know that there are occasions every once in a while where there might be an emergency, but I doubt 50% of you have an emergency every single weekend. I doubt it. I love you, I love you, I love you. And if I didn't love you, I would just pat you on the back and tell you that that's okay. But Jesus Christ himself said, do it every single time you gather as a remembrance of me. Not when it's convenient, every single time you gather as a remembrance of me. There's nothing in your life more important than remembering your Savior. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And it is a culture. And unfortunately, this culture of entitlement has found its way into the church and this self-righteousness that the world has. See, what the world has done is we create our own standard of what is good and bad. We even do it as Christians. Well, I don't believe Jesus would do that. By what basis do you say that? Show me the scripture that leads you to believe this thought about Jesus. But what we do is we create our own Jesus, one that conveniently kind of fits our lifestyle, right? We've become self-righteous like the world is self-righteous and we accuse each other and we hold each other to a standard that is false. There's one standard and it's not humanity's standard, it's God's. But here's the beauty. You have been set free of the world's standards. The world's self-righteousness should not apply to you. God has justified you. God has declared you innocent. And that doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to sin or evil. We should address evil. Then we should lovingly share the truth with people out there because it is only the truth and the liberation of Christ that will set people free. We don't receive this grace just so we can't do anything with it. We receive this grace so we can act on it and live in that freedom. 
And Paul says another very famous and, and very debated verse. So who can separate us from the love of Christ? It is, it is so wrongly taken that this is talking about salvation. It's not talking about you losing your salvation. This scripture is, if you have the Holy Spirit of God in a relationship with God, that all hell can come against you. All hell can come against you, but you can still stand. Nothing can rob you from the promises and the purpose and the protection of God. The Bible tells us that even if they come and they take your head, they can't take your soul. That's why Jesus said, don't be afraid of those that can kill your body. Just be concerned about the one that can cast your soul into hell. John says in 1 John, we know that we are of God and that the entire world is under the sway of the devil. But even if they all come against me, if I have the Holy Spirit, there's nothing they can do. You can't pluck me out of God's hand. So let's not miss the point. If we have fellowship with Jesus, nothing can tear us away from the love of God. No affliction, no distress, no persecution, no hunger, no nakedness, no danger of the sword. Because true followers of Jesus, we, Jesus made it very clear to us. I'm going to send you out like sheep to the slaughter. Jesus made it very clear to his disciples when he looked at him, he said, you guys are going to get beat up in every single town you go to and you're going to die for my name's sake. He made it very clear to us in this life, you're going to suffer, right? In this life, you're going to suffer. The followers, the true followers of Jesus have always been put to death for his name. We've always been like sheep to the slaughter and we've done it willingly because the ultimate sacrifice was made for us in Jesus Christ. He died for us. I will die for him. I will be a sheep to be slaughtered for his name. And then Paul says, regardless of what comes, regardless of hell coming against us, regardless of governmental persecution, regardless of even violence, Paul says, you're more than an overcomer. Listen, you don't have to fear the world because Jesus said, I've already overcome the world. The whole book of Revelation tells you that Jesus wins in the end, that we have nothing to be afraid of. It doesn't mean that we're not going to fall occasionally, but it means that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we get back up and we keep moving towards Christ. And then when we have true faith, it overcomes a life that is enslaved by evil, that we are no longer subject to evil's claims, to sin's claims. We're conquerors of that because he conquered that. But listen, all of that hinges. This is, this is my, my humble opinion. This entire book hinges on three simple words. The three, in my opinion, most important words in that entire book. That I am persuaded. That is when we are persuaded, convinced that everything God says he is, he is. How much differently would we live our lives if we were 100% persuaded that the words in this book are true, that the future is already settled to those that love Christ, that God is good, that God loves us? How would our lives look differently if we were persuaded that, that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons or rulers or governments or Things in the present or things in the future. No powers, no created thing. Nothing can take away my relationship with God. Nothing, nothing. How much differently would we function if we were persuaded? Persuaded. So listen, again, here's the thing. I've been saying this for the last couple of months. We're not called to be perfect in this life. It's not perfection. It is direction. It is us moving further and further towards Jesus. And the closer we get to him, the further we move away from evil. It's not perfection. We will only reach perfection when we get to heaven. We're not there yet. But we're moving in that direction. So let me clear up any theological conundrums that may be in here this morning. Whether you fall on Calvinism, Arminianism, whatever that, if you want to have those arguments, don't do it with me. I just don't have time. Here's the bottom line. If we have a true relationship with Jesus, you have nothing to be afraid of from your past. If you have repented for your sin, 1 Corinthians 13 says that love keeps no record of wrongs. God is perfect love. That when you stand in front of Christ Jesus, this is unfathomable to think, right? That if we have lived repentant, 
that when we stand up there, Jesus breaks open the book of our life. He says, Corey, I find no fault with you. Come in, good and faithful servant. How crazy that he has blotted those things out, never to be brought up, brought up against us again. We have no fear of the present evil in the world. You know what? A lot of you guys need to stop watching the news. I call it fear porn. That's what that is. And some of you are addicted to it. You're addicted to it. Turn it off. Turn it, turn, turn it off and read your Bible for God's sake. And see how much better you feel about everything. I don't have time to read my Bible. You watch CNN for two hours today. Sure you do. You don't have to be afraid of your past and you don't have to be afraid of the present evil in the world. You don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to be afraid of corrupt governments or nuclear warfare. You don't have to be afraid of, of hateful people. You don't have to be afraid of any of that. And you don't have to be afraid of the future. The future is lined out for those that believe. God has good things in store for you. You don't have to be afraid of the future. That's if you have a relationship with Jesus. And here's the other thing. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. If you have a relationship with Jesus, if you're dedicated to him, you don't have to worry about being perfect and earning your salvation either. Just be moving in the direction of Jesus. Well, can I lose my salvation? Just, just do what this book tells you to do and you never have to worry about it. The word divorce has never come up with my wife and I because we have a good relationship. There's no reason for it to come up. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, there's no reason for your eternal salvation to be in question. Don't worry about it. Just keep doing what Jesus wants you to do. Here's the other thing. Your title will not save you. Not just the Calvinism thing or Arminianism thing. Just because you have a bumper sticker on your car or a tattoo on your arm or a cross hanging from your rear view mirror, just because you Facebook posted, that will not save your soul. Just by clocking in for an hour and a half in this building every week, that will not save your soul. The only thing that will save your soul is a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said a tree will be known by its fruit. It's not what we say we are, it's what we do. That's why James said, don't be hearers of the word of God, be doers of the word of God. That's why James, the biological brother of Jesus, said, you can tell me you have faith. I'm going to show you I have faith by how I live. That's what James said. Because here's the thing, guys, we can fool everyone, but you cannot fool the one that made you. He knows your heart. Let's be honest. Jesus said, let your yes be a yes. Let your no be a no. Be honest, be genuine, be sincere, because at the end of your life, God knows, God knows. Let's be who we claim to be. Nothing wrong with the bumper sticker, nothing wrong with the tattoo, nothing wrong with the, the shirt that says you loved it. Nothing wrong with that, but live it. Make sure you're living it. Make sure you're living it. Because what it all boils down to, guys, is it boils down to if you're persuaded or not. Listen, are we truly persuaded that God is everything he says he is. Now, if we say, yes, we are persuaded, then why do we keep running to so many other things for our affirmation? If you believe that God is everything he says he is, why do we keep running to, to thumbs up on social media? Or why are we so concerned about the neighborhood we live in or the car we drive or or what people think about us all the time? Why are we so concerned if we believe that God is enough. If we believe that our purpose and identity comes from him, why do we keep running to weed or alcohol or sex or pornography or whatever we run to for that comfort? Why do we run to that? If we're persuaded that God is everything this book says he is, that's our strong tower. That's our deliverance. That's our hope. That's our comforter and counselor, right? Are we persuaded? Are we persuaded that we're not meant to live in our addiction? That we're not meant to live in our, 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 our insecurity? That we're not meant to live in debilitating sinful lifestyles? Are we persuaded that what the Bible says that we can overcome those things? Not because we're good, but because Jesus is good and his spirit is with us. Or, guys, 
Are we persuaded that the ways of this world are futile? I said it earlier, unfortunately, so many people, even in this church, have become lovers of the things of the world. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of you found your way into the church because those things failed. And I'm going to, I'm going to break it to you. They're going to fail you again. I've seen so many people come and God deliver them from the ways of the world only for them to run back thinking that there will be a different outcome, but there will not be because the ways of the world are futile. Are you persuaded that the only way is God's way? Do you have a groaning to be home, to be with him, right? Or are we holding on too much to the things of this world? If we're per persuaded that he is good, we must also believe that we have to address evil in our lives. This book was not written so you can tell everyone else how evil they are. This book was written so we can identify the evil in ourselves. Jesus says, before you start picking splinters out of everyone else's eye, let's get that log out of yours. That means that we have to be persuaded that God is good. And if God is the light, light has no fellowship with darkness. So we need to invite Jesus into the dark chambers of our heart and let him shine that light on us. I'm gonna end on a positive note. I know it's been rough. You guys are like, when, when is Greg coming back, right? <laughs> are you persuaded that God wants to make you in the image of his son? Listen, you're never going to be Jesus. You can't be equal to Jesus. But God wants to make you perfect like Jesus is perfect for eternity. Listen, listen, let me tell you what that means. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in that place, there will be no more cancer. There will be no more threat of nuclear war. There will be no more racism or sexism. There will be no more children that go hungry in foreign countries or children that go hungry in your own country. There will be no more. Think about heaven. Heaven will be full of us. I hope all of us in this room and we will be perfect, which means there will be no bad motives, no jealousy or anger. We will all have perfect minds and perfect bodies that can't die. Can you imagine Are you persuaded that God has a promise for you that though this life may be dark and it may be hard, that if you can just hold on, it says in the book of Romans that we're not just renting out heaven, that we become co-heirs with Christ, that when we get to the other side, God steps back and he says, it's yours. The new universe, those are yours to explore. This new earth. It says, do you know what it says in the book of Revelation that the gates of heaven are always open? That means that we have freedom to go explore. And God says, it's yours. It's yours. Are you persuaded that God has a future for you? Are you persuaded that you're not alone? Pastor Mike and I were talking When you watch on National Geographic, lions, when they follow uh, huge societies of other animals and they, they go and pounce on them, do you know they don't go for the strongest and the fastest? The lions look for the ones on the fringe that are hurt. They look for the ones that are weak, that are malnourished. And just like Peter said in the Bible, the devil is like a roaring lion and he's walking around looking for you when you're hurt and you're weak, and you're susceptible. And what he does is the devil speaks lies into your ear. You've done too much to be saved. You're alone. God has left you. Your friends have left you. And the devil starts to speak these lies. Why don't you just end it? You don't need to go to church. You've done too much. You don't need to read your Bible. Just veg out, right? Escape. And the devil starts to speak these things. Are you persuaded that you're not alone? I don't care if any other human in this world knows who you are. The God that created every human, he knows who you are. The greatest desire of mankind is to be known. And God says, I know you. 
I knew you before you were knit together in your mother's womb. I knew you, and I had a purpose for you, and I had a destiny for you, and I have a desire to be with you. Do you understand, brother, sister, you're not alone? You're not alone? And are you persuaded that nothing can separate you from that love that God has for you? That if you're walking with him, Bring all hell, government, nuclear warfare, whatever you want to bring. If God is for me, there is no one that can stand against me. Are you persuaded? Are you persuaded? Would you bow your heads with me, please?